um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Today is uh, we're doing a Binomics talk session, um, which we do every other week, uh, where we um, introduce, or have the pleasure to speak with experts from the field um, to get um, a variety of viewpoints. Today, um, I'm very happy to join, to have uh, Danilo join. I'll, I'll hand over to you in a minute. Before we do that, just very quickly uh, on, on myself. So I'm uh, Manu Zingo, co-founder, managing director at Binomics. Um, worked, I would say, all my professional life in pricing, revenue management, um, and what I did uh, to about five, a little over five years ago, we started Binomics, uh, essentially a SaaS solution um, that helps our customers make better pricing and revenue management decisions all in, in, in one platform. Um, and what enables our uh, users to do that is a technology that we developed, what we call the virtual customers or virtual shoppers. Um, and the what it does is essentially it replicates the buying behavior of, of real shoppers. So it predicts what happens when you change a price in your in, for your products, or if you change something in your portfolio, you add a product, you remove a product. If you change the way you work with promotions or any other revenue management levers, you can do that with very high precision. And that allows um, our customers to be much more profitable um, when um, in, in their decision making, because it allows them to, to look at many levers, price changes, portfolio changes, and so on in, in combination. And not like what many of the traditional tools only allow to do this in separation, use price elasticities for price changes and something else for portfolio changes. So this is what we do. Uh, if you're interested, uh, we're always open. Just send us a message after after the webinar, whenever you feel like it. Um, and now, without further ado, I hand over to Danilo. Um, before we do, of course, I think the, the reason why we invite you is uh, you have a book, which I have here. <laughs> uh, after this, I'll put it to the rest of the books, um, but I'm very happy. I'm very interested in the topic. Um, I took a look at, at what you've written and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to discussing um, the, what you have to say on, on pricing models. Danilo. Great, thanks a lot for having me and looking forward to this uh, great uh, opportunity to share a couple of thoughts and insights. Yeah, so um, to to get started, um, so Daniel, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the pricing model. So what's been your, your journey in, in pricing? Yeah, so my name is Dan and my passion is pricing. I've been uh, spending the last more than 20 years supporting corporations, entrepreneurs, private equity investors across industries, across geographies, in B2C and B2B, to increase profit through improved monetization and top-line excellence. I also did my PhD on pricing, uh, and uh, my whole career was dedicated to um, working on the top line side. I call it the sunny side of consulting because what we're doing here is supporting companies to become more profitable. So usually you also leave a lot of uh, uh, happy um, entrepreneurs and managers behind that eventually become your friends because you help them increasing profitability. Currently, I'm uh, heading the state's pricing and top line practices at Valcon, which is a uh, probably one of Europe's quickest growing consulting companies that offers both uh, the classical strategic um, solutions, the advisory services, but also data and technology. Yeah, um, th thanks. Um, I, one thing I've forgotten, um, so to all people listening to us, um, if you have any questions to Danilo, now is the time or in the next half hour is the time to, to ask these questions. Just write them into the, the chat um, and we'll um, ask Danilo um, your questions towards the end. Uh, really looking forward to those. Um, so you said you, pricing is on the sunny side of, of, of life. I, I, I certainly agree. That's also one of the things that uh, I find most interesting. Um, so what, what fascinates you most about pricing? Well, I, I uh, am really fascinated about, about, about this topic, and that's the reason why I'm still uh, doing pricing after more than 20 years. Well, there are multiple reasons. The first one is that pricing is the strongest and quickest profit level the companies have. So when you work on it, the beauty is if you do things right, you very quickly see a positive impact and the results in your top line. Mm -hmm. Second, there are a lot of topics that are uh, very, very hot. 
be it uh, AI-based pricing, be it uh, psychological pricing, be it uh, dynamic pricing. So a lot of topics that uh, uh, you find every day in the newspaper. Let's take the topic of uh, behavioral pricing that also won and was awarded a Nobel Prize because it's such an important and key topic. In this case, what you can do is to influence customer choices uh, without customers even noticing. So the magic word is here, psychological pricing. Let's take an example. Let's assume that uh, you are selling two wine bottles in a supermarket and uh, the, the typical normal customers come and shop. With mm -hmm. normal customers, I mean that they are not wine experts. And they would see two bottles and two prices. One price at five, one price at three euros. What happens? Well, the majority, 80%, will say, I don't want to make a wrong price decision. I will take the cheaper one. So the question is, how can you increase the amount of the revenues and sold units of the more expensive bottle without reducing price, without making a promotion? The magic uh, word and solution is with psychological pricing. So what you do is, for example, you introduce an anchor price. So suddenly it's not two, but three bottles, and one has a higher price, and the, the context of the choice changes. And customers will start saying, well, I don't want to have uh, the, the cheap wine bottle for three euros. It's a crappy wine. Who knows what's in it? Maybe I don't deserve the very expensive one for 10 because I would not appreciate it. Let's do a, a golden choice in the golden middle. So let's take the one for five. So now okay. the setting changed 50%. <laughs> so more than double than before are choosing the one in the middle. And this is the magic around pricing. Yeah, so uh, that's the, the wine example. I think is a is a good example, and it's one also that uh, we've been using. And what what I find interesting of, of what we're seeing in, in in also with our customers um, is that th th there's I think there's a nuance to this example, right? So it it works well with with the uh, with the wine example. I think that also the I mean, some of the results in behavioral economics have been questioned lately but th this one um, i think i've seen it to be very robust but it's um th there's some nuance to it so for example it works in wine because it's difficult to to know for most people what what makes a good wine or if they taste to it uh, is it really worth this much more money so wine's a bit tricky and they i think they they many like um like to have some guidance on on their decision and that's that's what this does it doesn't work as well in in areas where people know exactly what they want so for example in telco um, where people have a very good understanding of how much data volume for example they need in a month it's really it the the, the behavioral part that doesn't work as well because that people everyone pretty much has an understanding uh, of, of what they need to the end so they, there's nuance to that and but but these are good examples that 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 work very well um and i think that already leads us a bit to towards the main topic so what are the the the, the key topics or the what are what are the topics in pricing that that you're working on at the moment mostly well, i'm working quite a bit now on uh, pricing transformations so when it comes to changing the way companies are operating one typical topic there is passing from cost plus to very based pricing this is still very dominant in a lot of companies. Also, the client we're working with over here is a very large uh, corporation, very international and successful. Still, they're using the cost base. So it's about understanding value drivers and really migrate this way of working. Another typical uh, approach is the one related to making uh, the work much more efficient, precise, and better. And this means uh, passing from a manual uh, way of pricing to one supported by um, systems and solutions. And mm -hmm. by chance, uh, this early morning, I was uh, talking to a, a large client, a very successful Swiss corporation, and they told me that uh, they were using your solution. It was a great solution, and they're very happy about it. So okay. <laughs> solutions like yours are uh, one of the uh, great opportunities these companies have to really migrate uh, to a, um, a pricing which is more digital. And of course, and this is the topic of the book, uh, also understanding how can we create a new source of competitive advantage, changing the way we monetize is another very, very hot topic that you're seeing across industries. Okay, so that, yeah, first of all, very happy to hear that. Um, 
Um, and let, let's let's dig a bit deeper. I think that's also the, the topic of, of your book, um, looking at different pricing models. Um, so what are the, the, the main ideas um, that you're discussing in there? Yeah, the main idea is that um, there are new ways to monetize the value that you're delivering to customers. And then a number of companies, uh, across industries, you can observe this. The old way of monetizing was, give me so many euros and I give you the property of the product. This was typical in the automotive industry where you would buy a car for so many euros and you get the car and it's yours. Nowadays, it's uh, completely changing. You can see it really in all geographies, in all industries. And if you uh, stick to the automotive industry, <clears throat> You see companies like Volvo who say more than 50% of my cars, I don't want to sell them any longer. I sell you a subscription, a pay-per-use. I keep the ownership of the car. I want the relationship with the client. I want to cross-sell and own the whole customer life cycle. Or even uh, Neo, uh, Chinese players coming into Europe, they don't sell a single car. They just sell subscriptions. So it's really impressive how things are changing. Something that until recently was difficult to believe, but it's really across industries, across industry sectors. Okay, so I wasn't fully aware of these examples. So what, what, why do you think that we're, we're, that that these models are now relevant? Um, has something changed, like on the technology side, or has something changed? Has there been an innovation in pricing, or what? What would be the reason for that? Yeah. Of course, there are uh, big changes on the technology side. And I think Bionics is one of the best examples of how smart solutions can support companies in a digital world. But even small companies can now afford to change the business model that in, in previous years never would have been able to do so. Let me give you one example. Imagine that you are uh, the manager of a comedy theater. So what you sell are funny comedies. People come, they pay 35 euros, they are admitted to your show, enjoy, laugh, have a great entertainment, and then they leave. Suddenly, what happens in this case is that uh, taxes go up, your prices go up. And with this, uh, spectators stay out. Your mm -hmm. revenues are declining. You're starting to make losses. However, the quality of your comedies did not change. You still sell entertainment. Uh, you still sell people that are happy to enjoy it. So the problem is your price model. And uh, what we did is to, um, to bring a short example, a short two minute video that shows the solution of this uh, company, where you see how a little company with limited financial possibilities combined digital technologies with innovative price models to find the solution. So if possible, I would suggest to have a quick view yeah, of this video. I'll, I'll do that. And please tell me if it works. Yeah. Pay per laugh. The first comedy shows where you only pay for what you consume. We fitted each seat with a facial recognition system that detects the smile and proposed the following deal to spectators. Entrance will be totally free. If the show produces no laughs, you don't pay anything. However, if you laugh, you have to pay for each smile. Each smile produced is worth 30 euro cents, something that... ...that in this day and age is quite a reasonable price. At the end of the show, the spectator could check their laughter account before paying and even share it on social networks. And so that no one would cry for having laughed more than they could afford, the maximum amount to pay was 80 laughs for 24 euros. The average price of the ticket increased by 6 euros. The system was covered by the main national media outlets, and this produced 35% more spectators. Each paper laugh show produced 28,000 euros more ticket money than was normally taken. Currently, the system is being copied in other theatres in Spain. A mobile phone app was created as a system of payment, and the first season ticket was launched for the number of laughs, not shows. But we should also not write off the paper cry. Or paper what the fuck system. What the fuck? What the fuck? Or maybe not. Paper laugh. The first comedy shows where you only pay for what you consume. 
Yeah, I always enjoy this example because it's quite funny and it shows you how with digital technologies you can uh, change things. Of course, there are uh, many other examples. This was now a B2C example. The same applies, however, also to B2B. Imagine in this case that you are a premium producer of dishwashers, dishwashers and you, you are serving big hotel chains, big restaurant chains. So you are a very successful uh, hidden champion that is focused mm -hmm. on this niche with a premium price. At some point, however, your niche is quite uh, saturated, so you don't grow any longer and you need to find new growth opportunities. What you discover are small entrepreneurs opening cool pubs, for example, in the nice uh, winter resorts or uh, next to beautiful beaches like the ones that I visited this summer in Sardinia doing some windsurfing. The issue with these places is that maybe the entrepreneurs are not having so much money to afford your expensive washing machine, but want it. And then they have a seasonal business. So why buy a machine if you use it only six or four months a year? So the, uh, the, the solution here was a paper wash solution. So uh, you are getting the machine without paying anything with mm -hmm. the uh, service installation, with the spare parts, with the washing powder. However, you pay 250 euros per washing cycle. It's a washing cycle package. At the end, you are paying a high premium price. However, uh, you don't uh, uh, notice this or you can afford it because it's just a payment based on the use. This uh, was a solution introduced by Winterhalter, this leading company that was also copied then by many others and shows again that uh, it, it is something that uh, covers a specific need, a specific segment and can be super successful to uh, help you growing in a new market. Okay, maybe we can go just just a little bit deeper into this. So, like the, the video that we just saw um, on the paper lab, wh why did it work? I think that there's a component of technology, so it's it's not possible to to measure the labs. Um, that would have been difficult like a hundred years ago. You probably had, had to have like a person in front of each guest, like noticing what what the labs are, um, and the same is true to some extent um, with like the washing machine now, now it can be done um, or that there are certain businesses who prefer like variable cost over over fixed cost um, other examples so that one thing that that i had thought of today was um, so i i'm renting my bicycle uh, here in cologne and for me the, the main reason was um, the, the one I had before was stolen after three weeks um, oh. and uh, and this one um, it's a subscription they they look very unique, and um, so and they, what one of their main to, to me like the main, main selling point was that you can't steal them really because everyone knows that um, wh where they come from and so you no one can sell them right, and you can also you also can't repair them yourself so they have this extra say value driver or feature that they they can't really be stolen. Yeah, um, I think that this is very well summarized. So I think one of the key elements is really to understand how can I address also specific needs that uh, with the previous uh, revenue model I was not addressing. And, and, and this opens up, and, and we saw it in the case of Winterhalter with the washing machines uh, based uh, on use, a new market segment that simply mm -hmm. uh, either did not have access to your products or was not able to afford them. However, with a different monetization scheme, suddenly a premium product gets accessible. Of course, there are a number of prerequisites. In the case of Winterhalter, this means that you must have a large financial shoulders to make sure that you can afford an installed base where you get paid uh, by the use. This is something that not everybody can do. But if you have this financial power, then of course you create an advantage. Yeah, so and even, I, I don't know if we can, Go into the economics of this example because in the end they they need to make more money with with the subscription than than through selling like in my my bicycle example i think i pay the price of a new bicycle over a period of let's say two to three years um so um after that and i don't know my previous bike i had for 10 years so it's this this renting is much more expensive so that that's why it also works for the other side um, and the economics in the in the washing machine example that you have have to be similar, so that the the customer pays sort of for the extra flexibility 
of having not fixed investment here, right? Exactly, exactly. Very, very well noted. Cool. Do you, do you have an, another example or um, where where such economics or the dynamics make sense? Yeah, well, another example, uh, we can take, for example, the one of uh, um, subscription in the software as a service field. Often people think then automatically to LinkedIn or, or Salesforce, but one of the pioneers was Adobe. Adobe, mm -hmm. we know the company from Photoshop, from PostScript, from Acrobat. What they were doing in the past was selling uh, their products. It was uh, giving away their uh, um, unlimited license, but with giving away the products, uh, they also lost the contact to customers. So what they decided to do is to move to what they called Adobe Creative Cloud, where you would buy a subscription and uh, get like these updates, uh, get uh, the possibility to cross-sell, upsell to customers and maintaining the relationship. Initially, uh, the shareholders were very skeptical and said, well, we are making so much money. We have a, a, a net profit margin of 90%. Why should we risk to go this new path and put everything at stake? But then the management managed to push through this new approach, and it was super successful. It was a game changer. From uh, uh, 22 billion, uh, when they started uh, introducing this, they are now at uh, 270 billion as a company valuation, with a 16 billion of annual turnover. So an amazing yeah. increase of uh, uh, profitability and uh, market value. Another great example that. Uh, changing the way you're monetizing and uh, making sure that you manage and own the relationship with the customers being capable to cross and upsell makes the difference yeah so and and also you yeah, it seems to me that there are like factors that that are supporting this right so one is um certainly that the capital markets have learned to like subscription models um it's certainly that um with this subs online subscription and software it's almost, I would say, impossible to, to steal software, um, which was when I, when I was in, in high school, uh, which was very common that you share like your CD or, or disc with others. So that's with like an online subscription, very, very difficult. And, um, and also you have the advantage for the user that the software is always up to date, right? So you don't run the risk of having like the no updates for a year or two. Because with online as Adobe, these softwares, they're always up to date. So there, there are like many, I would say, factors that really support it that are always specific to the case, which leads me to the, the next question I would like to ask. So what are, we talked about some examples that really have come like washing machines, software, cars, so super different cases. Um, it seems to me from what you said is that it always has to be specific that there's no, um, like, it can't like have the same model work in every situation. Um, so what, what are maybe some of the, like the general principles that are important, um, first, and then, um, maybe like the differences between industries, what works maybe in software, what works in, in, in other cases? Yeah, yeah. I think that these are, are very important questions and thanks for raising these. Well, there are multiple uh, principles you should look at to make sure that your new uh, and innovative revenue model works. First, you have to fully understand what kind of needs are you addressing. So making sure that you understand what uh, the need is and how you can capture and monetize the value that comes from this need. This means then fitting uh, it to the best price model. In my book, I may show you 10 possible price models but there might be also hybrid ones that are a combination of those. And then you have to define appropriate price metrics. For example, are your customers paying per kilometer? Are they paying per lot? Are they paying per uh, usage by hours? So that you have a clear metric that you are monetizing. And mm -hmm. finally, you do then uh, a definition of prices, price ranges, price points, in order to uh, establish then with price setting how this will be looking like in details. In terms mm -hmm. of companies or industries, um, I would say that there is not a, a set in stone rule uh, what works best in which uh, industry because it always depends on the precise need that you are addressing with the price model. However, uh, you can see that in some industries there are more frequent uh, price models like in software subscription has uh, become quite popular 
as you were mentioning, a nice thing is that um, you have a revenue in a regular way. And when I talk to private equity investors, this is something they love seeing regularly money coming in. And uh, investors in general like this model also quite a bit. Yeah, but subscription do doesn't work well in, in every industry, right? So it works well right. like software, like streaming. I, for, for myself, I like what, one thing I did is like compare how much I spent for like Netflix and, and things like that versus how much I spend on toothpaste. So you can like rank all the different things that 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 you need on a regular. It's it's really interesting. Like if you compare these things, um, right. coming to the end of like just the the final question before we go to the the audience's questions. Um, I think m most of our listeners are working somewhere in, in pricing, revenue management. Many of them also in mature organizations that have worked with an existing pricing model for, for a long time. What, what recommendations do you have if they want to rethink how they, the, the pricing model that they work with and, and how to make it then work within the organization? Yeah. Well, I, I would always recommend to bring uh, the voice of the customers to the table inside the company. So really coming from the market and posing some questions. For example, did my customers need change? Is the current pricing model still good enough to monetize the value that we are delivering? Let, let me give you a, a couple of examples. Okay. Uh, all of us, unfortunately, went through the, the pandemic. And what happened? Needs changed during the pandemic. So this is, was also an opportunity. A number of retailers, be it Okado, be it Morrison, uh, decided to introduce new subscription models. Also, uh, players like Barilla, Ilis Cotti in Italy changed completely a number of offerings. Barilla, for example, introduced Cucina Barilla. This is a subscription package for around 40 euro a month, where you get a selection a box of uh, noodles, of sauces, of uh, recipes, so that you can uh, have the convenience not to go out and uh, cook what you got at home. The, this was a new need that changed. <clears throat> uh, it was understood and caught by the company. And this new need and this new segment was then served. Of course, after the pandemic, uh, the situation changed again, but still it shows how quick companies were capable in capturing new revenue sources and creating thus a sustainable uh, advantage by introducing a new price model. Okay, perfect. I think we're already at the end of the time. Let me just ask you one question from the audience. So um, I'll just read it. Danilo, could you share your insights on how businesses can effectively leverage data visualization tools and techniques to communicate complex pricing models and strategies in both internal stakeholders and uh, with customers? Yeah, well, uh, I think that this sounds like a question that is also uh, related to uh, your company because you do great visualization. I, I always get uh, fantastic feedbacks when uh, we introduce or use tools like Binomics that visualize uh, a number of insights. Uh, one example is uh, related, for example, to promotions. I had one customer who was setting prices but didn't have uh, a clear transparency of what was going on out there in the market. So what mm -hmm. we did was to introduce a web scraping solution that would capture for the key competitors uh, what was going on in terms of uh, promotions, would raise then some alerts and some flags to show some key uh, changes in the market. And the customer's reaction was, I'm fascinated. It's the first time that I can really take a real-time price decisions based on what is going on in the market. So this was, let's say, a nice example of visualizing some key information linked to data and then using this important information to then uh, uh, set optimal prices. And I believe that a solution that like Binomics would have a lot of examples like this, that with visualizations and with a nice uh, KPI dashboards and so on, provides a lot of user information to become more efficient and more effective in uh, managing prices. Perfect. I think... That's a perfect, perfect ending for the for the webinar. Um, yeah, Danilo, thank thank you so much for taking the time and and sharing your your insights with us. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I uh, hope um, we have uh, at, at the future time another chance to to speak. I think there's a new book coming up <laughs> at some point that I've seen uh, already. I think on Amazon or somewhere. 
Uh, so I really enjoyed the talk. Um, for all the listeners, tomorrow, next week we have our, again our regular webinar where it's just uh, us here at Binomics talking about pricing and RGM strategies for profitable growth. Then the week after we have another talk with uh, also another expert from the field for Sevilla. Um, and we're really looking forward to this next session. Thank you so much, Danilo. Um, I hope you have a good flight back uh, to home and then a wonderful weekend. Same for all the listeners in the audience. Thank you so much and I uh, hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. You, bye.